Hello, welcome to this lecture on the history of higher education in um, the United States. As with some other lectures, I'm going to be using uh, PowerPoint um, slides, so uh, let me uh, bring those up um, right now. And I'm going to do that and um, start uh, sharing my slides with you. And I'm going to go to a view that gives you a slightly bigger uh, screen so you can see um, a bit more. I, I do know that history is not everyone's favorite topic, but sometimes it's important to obtain a little bit of background knowledge to better better understand and um, study a, a subject. So that's that's what we're doing here because history provides that that foundation for the understanding that you need as you go through um, this course. This particular slide, uh, I would say um, a couple of things ab about it. Um, first, uh, the picture on the left of Abraham Lincoln with a young man. Why would I include a picture of Abraham Lincoln? I think a, a little known aspect of Abraham Lincoln's life is that he really was a tremendous supporter of uh, higher education, a real champion of early higher education. He signed the, the Morrell Land Grant Act in 1862. I'll provide a little bit more information about that later in terms of how that impacted um, higher education and he really uh, supported it in in many different kinds of ways so I wanted to provide that um, photo. In addition uh, there's a picture there of Gruen Hall as it looked in 1948 just after the uh, Lemoyne College was started and it was built originally on a tract of land known as the Gifford uh, Farm, a lot of farmland in uh, in that particular um, area. So uh, important to have both of those photos there, I think. Then if you notice uh, down at the bottom there there is a, uh, a URL. I have posted these PowerPoint slides in Blackboard, so if you want to look the, at them at a, a later time, go through them. These are all uh, active links that you can click and find out more information. And this particular slideshow was adapted in part from the website that I note there at the, at the bottom. I really like the way that the originators of um, portions of this slideshow developed a, kind of a framework or a schematic for showing history with a timeline, so um, you, you'll see that as we as we go through this second slide. The objectives for this uh, presentation and what I hope to accomplish with uh, this particular lecture. It does contain a lot of uh, heavily packed information, and I will try to point things out as as we go. Um, so, but because this is a provides, an, as I mentioned earlier, a nice technique for portraying history in a timeline for, format. I think you'll find that to be a valuable tool, as did I. And we start this timeline on my, in the next slide in the early 1600s when higher education began in the United States and up until very recent uh, times. And then, of course, uh, at the end of this slideshow is an invitation for your feedback in a um, Blackboard forum um, discussion. We I, a couple of things that I would point out before we actually show the timeline schematic, and that is that we all are based upon it. And you, if you read Chapter One or when you read Chapter One in the book, uh, some of this is mentioned there. Uh, Phil Aubach, one of the uh, editors of the book, I think did a, a very nice job in this particular uh, chapter. And just to note to you that most of higher education in the United States is based on what people call the, the European, European model. And that, in many respects, revolves um, around the Paris model, which is where the notion of a lecture or lecturer or a professor at the front of the class uh, comes. And another important point is that there was also some inf influence of the, the German uh, universities and so that's not to uh, to be underlooked um, in either in terms of how they had an influence uh, in the develop development of graduate education in and how that has been adopted in this country you'll notice that the the third bullet there it says the almost University of Bologna model 
That's a very important one because um, the Italians had a different way of thinking about higher education and this was considered by in the early history of this country and if we had adopted that I'm just wondering what United what uh, in the United States higher education would look like today. The Bologna model really put the student at the center of, of things and what would that have meant today in terms of the way higher education institutions are run and it really ties in well those of you that happen to know a little bit and as you may learn more about me as a professor uh, my uh, scholarly interest and most of my research during uh, my uh, four, four plus decades as a professor has been aimed at helping the learner in, in the case of what most of my work is the adult learner uh, take on increasing responsibility for his or her own learning and so the the Bologna model may have made that even more salient today in terms of, um, of where we are. Higher education of course was um, spurred in, in this country by its increasing economic and social development um, over time and um, the post-World War II in, you are all, I, most of you I anticipate are uh, too young to have been around during World War II. Uh, I happen to have been myself and after World War II, there was a tremendous impact on higher education in, in the United States. A lot of that was through the GI Bill and its support for uh, putting mostly men, a few women, but putting mostly men into um, to higher education. And so it was not unusual to find uh, a number of young uh, men in their mid to late and beyond 20s streaming into higher education because it was supported for them. Our sister one of our sister institutions, Syracuse University, for example, even had barracks, barrack-like buildings for a while that housed um, soldiers and mostly males, uh, soldiers and, and their, their families. So there was a lot, a lot of a huge uh, growth spurt uh, right after World War II that has continued to this day. Of course, there was the whole notion of universal access to higher education. One of the A's from the, the lecture related to the preface in the, the textbook, and that's still something that is uh, being talked about um, even today. And I put in there purposely the the legacy of the uh, of the 60s because of the fact that uh, started, starting first. From President Kennedy, and then after his assassination, President Johnson, what was known then as the the Great Society, Flower Power, etc., that really began to propel higher education and in, in its growth. And of course, the whole notion of technology and its impact right up until today. And what will the fu future be for all of us in terms of what technology has is doing? Um, i.e. this class and the way I am making this lecture and the way you are taking this class and, and we can't really predict um, how rapidly all of this will change with uh, uh, tablets and smartphones and, and increasing number of apps that enable us to do almost anything. So uh, kind of some exciting times to be studying higher education. Here is the, um, the first of those slides that I mentioned that showed the way the originators of this developed a system for portraying a timeline that I, that I liked. And so uh, I wouldn't necessarily have done this myself, but the, they chose to um, use as a metaphor the wars that um, have impacted on the United States in various ways and they started with the American Revolution obviously a very important in the United States a very important war in terms of uh, getting freedom in this in this country and, and so on and you'll see the way that this timeline shows various things that have happened uh, the first college in in the United States was um, Harvard um, some of you may have known that in 16 36 you can see some of the other institutions and when and when they um, came in and uh, often religion had a very Im 
important role to play in, in higher education. Most of the initial institutions that were formed in this country, um, religious affiliation of some sort to, took place in, in, in many ways. And I purposely put in there uh, for you to, to note that in 1789, the very first Jesuit college in the United States, Georgetown, um, was formed. And so we'll talk a, a little bit more about, um, about that as, as we go along. This next uh, slide uses the Civil War as a as kind of a point of reference, 61 to 65. And I've tried to highlight on that particular slide uh, some of the things for you to, to think about and read about and that you will be um, reading about. Um, for example, the uh, I'd mentioned in the very first slide that um, President Lincoln had uh, signed the Morrell Land Grant Act in 1962. What that means, if you're not familiar with that, tracts of land and some money through this grant were set aside for um, every state in the Union, and every state had at least one land grant institution. A few of them had uh, had more than one for a number of reasons that uh, you can study about if you're in interested in that. Um, but it, this was an important thing actually for me professionally because out of the morale land grant was formed institutions like uh, Michigan State University where I obtained my uh, bachelor's degree and that was a land grant institution and my first job was as a professor was at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, Nebraska, another land grant um, university. And my second professional job, when I moved from there, I went to Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa, another land-grant institution. So there were a lot of uh, ties uh, personally for me in what happened with the, uh, the land-grant movement. Here in the state of New York, um, you may already know this, but uh, Cornell is the land-grant institution in, in uh, New York. There's actually an association of state university and land-grant colleges um, the NS and ASULGC, and that has helped to further higher education in a number of ways. I put there purposely when the first coeducational college, Oberlin, was developed in 1883, and another important one was the first um, black college, Cheney University, near Philadelphia. Uh, known f by many years as Cheney College and then eventually Cheney University, was really the first of what today are referred to as HBCU institutions, historically black colleges and universities. Uh, Norman Clay was not around in 1836, but it is um, today. And some of the states that had more than one land grant institution, were, they were mainly in the South, and that was because uh, some in some of those states they had uh, a black college that was a land-grant institution. So uh, some, some important things to, to look at on that particular slide. And as I noted, you can look, uh, you can look get at this PowerPoint slide through Blackboard and look at it in more detail if you're interested and want to actually click on some of the links that are available. This next slide built around uh, World War uh, I, the Smith-Lever Act. With this act actually formed the Cooperative Extension Service. If you don't know about the Cooperative Extension Service, it is the, the act that formed within these land-grant institutions state and then county offices to help uh, children, youth, and adults with uh, agriculture, at least initially agricultural related uh, education and activities. And it uh, out of it came what was known as the county extension agents and my very first professional job after my bachelor's degree at Michigan State University was in uh, the state of Iowa as a cooperative extension county agent working with uh, f uh, farm families in, in various kinds of ways so I have a direct tie um, um, to that. Um, the first actual designation of HBCU, the Historic Black and College uh, University, colleges and universities, 
was in an act in uh, 1965. Today there are 105 of the HB um, CUs. Other things on that slide that you uh, you can uh, read uh, more about in terms of the, for example, the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, uh, was formed in 1933. And this was tied to high, higher education in various kinds of ways. Often young men uh, during the Depression uh, looking for work and could not obtain um, work through, just because they have a college education, would join the Civilian Conservation Corps. And people lived in barracks, often um, like what actually happened um, during, I mentioned the, the GI Bill, when people lived on in barracks on campuses. And they built uh, educational settings and uh, museum, uh, outdoor museums, etc. And I had an uncle, for example, who worked for the CCC in Michigan and was able to send money home to his, uh, his family. And uh, this was a, an important source of income and it also put people to work. Uh, closest to us here in the Syracuse uh, area, greater Syracuse area, is the CCC that a group of people came in and built what uh, is known as the Chittenangle Falls Recreation Area. If you ever get a chance to go to, you haven't seen it yet, over in, um, to the south of Chittenangle is, a, a, is a, a waterfall area and all of the stonework and the park itself was built by the, the CCC. Other acts there that I think that uh, will be important to do um, some study of if, if any of this is of interest to you. This next slide is the built around uh, World War II in that time period and um, some things to point out on this particular slide that uh, is um, I think of uh, potential interest um, to you and that is um, the fact that the Truman Commission in 1947 Another president who stepped in, President Truman, stepped in and said we needed to do much more for higher education. There's an active link there if you go to the PowerPoint slides and you can find out uh, more about that. Uh, uh, Brown v. Board of Education, for those of you in, in education that may know of that in terms of a landmark decision uh, relative to blacks and whites in public schools, 1964, and all of the turmoil that took place during that uh, time period. Uh, interesting one that uh, 1944 women temporarily outnumbered men in higher education and that was because of World War II and uh, more of course men in the, in the military than, than women and so women, the numbers of women in higher education increased. After World War II, because of the GI Bill, that uh, changed again until um, the last decade or so, or so women now are again outnumbering uh, men in higher education. That GI Bill provided, as I said earlier, provided uh, money for returning uh, veterans from World War II to go to higher education um, and take, take advantage of higher education opportunities and, and it certainly helped me. I utilized some of those monies to help support my both my master's degree and a, por a portion of my doctoral degree. So it helped uh, uh, many, many people. So. Again, uh, a number of acts there. You'll note, of course, Lemoyne College starting in 1946. Uh, we can you know, obviously be proud of that because we are involved with this institution, and it is the second youngest of all of the uh, 28 Jesuit colleges in the United States, and uh, pridefully the very first one to open as a, a co-ed institution. So uh, some things to think about um, there. Um, I have mentioned Syracuse University, and I've mentioned, of course, uh, Lemoyne College. Another institution of higher education in this area is Onondaga Community College, OCC. That began in 1962, and there's been a tremendous growth of community colleges in the United States. No doubt we will talk more about that as we go um, throughout the semester. Those of you interested in working in higher education, Community colleges may well be uh, an area to think about in terms of uh, uh, job opportunities. This is built around the, the Vietnam War, and uh, uh, again, I didn't necessarily personally like the war metaphor, but just to show you what the originators uh, were utilizing as, as their way of thinking about that. 
Higher Education Act in 65, it mentioned this great, the Great Society of President Johnson and the various things that he as a president and follow up to uh, President Kennedy did to support higher education in various kinds of ways. 69, unbelievably, it, was until, it wasn't until 69 that Yale and Princeton accepted their first uh, women uh, undergraduates. Uh, some of the other things there to, to think about, affirmative action and civil rights, and um, the fact that native natives in this country were able to uh, go to college with various kinds of support. So um, a, a number of things there that um, might be of uh, value to you. The What is known by some as the peace area, um, continuing this notion of uh, wars and the metaphor, the, the pre- 9-11 period, there was a, a relatively long period of time in this country where there was not a major um, war, and but in terms of higher education, uh, the Carnegie, Carnegie classification scheme uh, began in 1970, and a number of institutions utilized that classification scheme as a way of helping others evaluate their ranking and so uh, magazines like uh, uh, very US World and News and World Report will have an annual ranking and others you'll find on on the internet in various ways, ways of ranking um, colleges. Some of the Disability Act and uh, what that did to help uh, support people with disabilities to go back to higher education, Title IX and its direct impact on uh, institutions in, in various ways in terms of equal support for men and women in athletics. So a lot of things happened uh, during this particular time period that are, are, are worth your uh, study in, in one way or another. Um, the post 9-11, uh, Af Afghan, Iraq and Afghanistan there, um, one could add to that today of course Egypt and <laughs> Syria and uh, there's always something seeming to go on. Um, this is another decade and works actually a little bit beyond now. Um, what what would you fill in in terms of what's happening in, in higher education? I'll say just a bit more about that uh, after this, uh, this next slide. I purposely included some references here for those of you who take the time to look at this PowerPoint slide and click on some of these uh, references. These are some of uh, what I think are some very useful and important links. And this was a, this one by Doris, was a, it's, a, it's a great blog um, about higher education that um, I encourage you to take a, a look at. Um, the second one is uh, I found another online PowerPoint presentation on history that provides sort of a contrast to what I tried to do in this in this lecture. I invite you to take a look at that one. Uh, another look at higher education is that um, the third link, as well as the fourth fourth one, a, a very well done overview of higher education in the United States. And then I included at the bottom there a good resource for you as you begin to build an understanding of higher education. I've mentioned this in my opening uh, uh, comments for the class and it's mentioned a couple of times in the workbook, the idea of utilizing not only the textbook but other material that you can access in various ways just to continue your growth and development in knowledge about higher education. And so the American Council on Education has a wonderful higher education section and I put that uh, link at the very bottom. That might be another one that you would add as one of your favorites in this class and, and look at uh, um, periodically. So now it is really your turn. Um, what do you believe that the history of higher education tells us about higher education today and the future of higher education and higher education leadership and perhaps your role in higher education um, leadership now and in the future. So there is an associated Blackboard um, discussion forum on the history of uh, higher education and I will uh, I'll start that off with a um, with, with a, an opening comment and so 
if you uh, go to that Blackboard forum and uh, add your thoughts in there, we'll have another uh, wonderful discussion on uh, this particular topic.